request. So this is lecture 12, um, and this is the 14th lesson, quote unquote, that I've done. So um, that's how I'll file it since I had to split the first ones apart because they're really long. Um, so anyway, this is from the Lecture 12 PowerPoints, which is called Molecular Markers RFLP, which stands for Restriction Fragment Link Polymorphism, PCR, which is Polymerase Chain Reaction, uh, Microsats, which are uh, small uh, repetitive element elements. Um, and uh, the next lecture, so Lecture 12B, I added, uh, and that includes DNA sequencing. So, um, I might have enough time to include them. I might have to split this. I'm not sure um, how this is going to go. So, anyway, we're just we're going to talk about how geneticists solve stuff, and we've already talked about this. So, we, we observe some sort of phenotypic variation, which is, you know, wild-type guinea pigs are black, and uh, mutant guinea pigs might be white. And so, we're like, hmm, well, what caused that? So we do the crosses to make sure that it's a single gene inheritance. And so we know that if we do that, um, and you know, if it's dominant or recessive or it's excellent or whatever, and we do all these crosses to figure it out. And then once we do that, then we can do the, our two point test cross, which we talked about in the last lecture. And we do the two point test cross uh, with another gene. So maybe this is gene B we can figure out the where the gene A is mapped onto the chromosome. And maybe we'll just say that this is chromosome number one just for fun. So we can locate that gene on a physical map. Um, once we do that, then we can sequence this. So this is a this is a, a recombinant map. Remember that's done in centimorgans, which is the percent of the recombinant offspring. And then this one, uh, would be done by uh, basically sequencing the DNA. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. And so uh, once we get the sequence, we can compare the sequences between the white guinea pig and the black guinea pig. This is kind of going in a circle like so. Um, so we can observe the difference between the white guinea pig and the black guinea pig on a molecular level and notice that this mutation is a GC pair that uh, was mutated to an AT. And that caused the pigment in the skin to be uh, either absent or white. All right. So there's a difference between physical maps and recombinant maps. We Remember we talked about this. So this is 4% of the offspring are recombinant gamete or made from recombinant gametes. 12%, remember these are added together. So 2% of each one. Um, and there'll be questions like that on the pro the next problem set. The this one is twelve and twelve, so these are all estimated to be equally uh, equidistant from each other using mapping, and then we actually do a, a physical map. So this is a recombination map. Where physical map was is done from the DNA sequence, and so maybe we would find that the distance between A and B is actually nine megabases, which is a million bases. Um, and maybe the distance between B and C is also nine mega bases. So we know like factually that these are equidistant apart from one another. But here, this might not really uh, show a true uh, distance. And the reason is, is that maybe, you know, cause this is a low number of recombinants, maybe this area has a very low crossover and this area has a very high crossover, even though they're close together, it does happen. So we call those recombinant hotspots or weak spots. Um, and so anyway, we could find that these genes, even though we figured them out in centimorgans, might not actually be that same distance on a physical map. And that's what we just said. So, um, yeah, this is megabases, so that's a thousand, or a million, this is a thousand. 
Okay, and we just talked about that. So, so we're going to have a recombination hotspot where we have lots of recombination or a cold spot, like a weak or low spot, where we have very little recombination. So the, the higher the crossover frequency, the higher the number of recombinants and the greater the genetic distance. Okay, so if we look at the visible mutations of a fruit fly on the X chromosome, so this is actually a map, the physical length of that chromosome, the X chromosome, right? Remember we talked about fruit flies have X's and Y's, but it has nothing to do with sex. The physical length of that is 20 million or 20 megabases. Uh, there's only about 20 mutations in fruit flies so if we looked at all the lines here maybe yellow body weird wings raspberry eyes fork bristles which are basically the things that they attach with so um the map isn't useful for pinpointing the gene location because there's not enough genes <laughs> we can't really tell uh where those genes are so in order to do that we can use something called molecular markers Molecular markers improve the recombination map by providing us with more regions, even though those aren't uh, actual phenotypes that we can see. We can still see these markers if we look at it on a molecular level, um, and that, that those make the map more dense. So, you know, maybe we have a mutation here, but it doesn't do anything because it's in between genes, or maybe it's you know not affecting the, the phenotype, but we can use that because it's still going to recombine at the same rate as we would see a phenotype. So as long as we have the DNA sequence, we can see the recombination of that event. Um, and then we use that to line up the recombination map with the physical map, the one that we've created from DNA sequencing. So this is basically just showing you exactly what I talked about. So let's say we have allele 1 and allele 2. Now remember, the alleles are different from each other as long as there's a mutation in it. Um, and this could be in, in the intergenic spacer. It could be in a, like a intron that doesn't matter. It could be any, uh, area. So it just has to vary among individuals. It doesn't really have to affect the phenotype. It's just a different DNA sequence, you know? Um, so these single base changes we call single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Sometimes they're called SNPs, like so people put this in here, like an I and a P, uh, IPS, SNIPS for SNPs. Um, in every genome, there these SNPs are present, and they're generally present every 300 to 1,000 base pairs. Remember, Every mutation doesn't affect, like if, if we had a change here in the third position, it might not affect the outcome of the protein. Uh, it could be in an intron, it could be in an intergenic spacer, it could be in, you know, anything. So it doesn't necessarily have to affect the phenotype if, to, if you have a mutation. But we still number them, like allele 1, 2, 3, to distinguish each of them uh, from one another. Okay, so there are lots of different molecular markers. Um, the most common one are, are called variable number tandem repeats or VNTRs. Um, they're generally short, repetitive sequences. And uh, so here we have an example. So this, this allele would have a repeat of five A's and T's. So one, two, three, four and five. So we would call it AT5. That would be allele one. And in this, I'm going to pause this because this is a little weird. I'm going to move this. Over. Okay. Well, that's better on my end anyway. All right. So then in this allele, so we would call allele two, we could have, we might have two repeats of A and T. So here we have AT and AT. So this would be, uh, A, a microsatellite, right? And so in 
non-plant geneticists, we call these STRs, and in plant geneticists, they call them SSRs. I don't know why, but they just do. So it's the same thing. It's just repetitive elements. Usually there are two nucleotides, three nucleotides, sometimes four. Like an example of that might be like a on the Y chromosome, there's a thing called GATA that's a repeat. So that's a, a four nucleotide repeat. You could get a trinucleotide repeat, which is like maybe ATT. Um, or a, a double a nucleotide repeat, like this one that we're talking about here. All right, so so differences between individuals, um, we term polymorphism. Right, poly means many, and morphism is change or type. So every organism, in order to be useful for mapping or identifying one person from another. Um, has to have a polymorphism in that region. It would be similar to um, if someone robbed you and you and everybody on earth had brown hair and you said the person that robbed me had brown hair, it would be very little to no use to anyone. So what we're looking for is variation in individuals that and these variations can either be environmental variations. Uh, so uh, when I was a kid, uh, me and my friend had uh, a turtle. It had baby turtles. Uh, we both raised the babies. He didn't feed his, and I fed mine a lot. So mine got really big. I mean, you could see a difference. Mine was twice the size of his. And so that wasn't due to genetics. That was due to environmental uh, variation, right? Like what it's eating, how much sun it's getting, right? The, a plant that gets more sun is going to grow bigger has nothing to do with genetics. Uh, and then we're looking at variation that's caused by genes, right, that are polymorphic. So we have changes in each of those genes, right, and we, we would call those alleles. Um, every organism is genetically unique because of those variations in genes, right? So what makes you different than your parents is that your uh, your changes in your alleles um, species that are related to one another uh, their their genes don't vary a lot um, and they might be identical and this isn't really like surprising because um, if you you know did ancestry or 23 and me which is pretty you know popular now and in the mainstream and by the way they use snps to to figure out this so they're not sequencing your whole genome they're using a like a million different snps to f to figure out what because the human genome doesn't vary that much uh because we're a young species but we'll talk about that when we talk about population genetics but uh in the end you know that if someone my wife is going crazy over this because her friend is, you know, at, at, shares like 12% DNA. So, you know, like, I mean, if someone shares 50% DNA with you uh, versus someone that sells shares 12%, well, this person is going to be more closely related to you than this person. And so uh, there might be another person that's 1% DNA and they're going to be more distantly related and so on and so forth. And this number could get smaller. Um, and then we can use this to figure out relationships. Um, so anyway, the younger the species, the more, the less variation in the population because it hasn't had time to change. And that's what evolution is. It's change, change in alleles, allele frequency over time and so that's how we get variation right we get new alleles that come into the population and we'll talk about how they come in and how they get taken out uh rather quickly when we get to population genetics so that's a polymorphism oops okay so the term dna fingerprinting uh, came into the mainstream because uh when DNA was first used as a way to identify an individual uh, difference in individuals, one from another. Alec Jeffries did this first. Um, he used it in a criminal trial. Uh, he used mitochondrial DNA. 
remember we know mitochondria have DNA and he used that because mitochondria don't recombine remember your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother solely and we talked about that in previous lectures so the term DNA fingerprinting is simply just means using someone's DNA to different to find polymorphisms to differentiate one person from another it has nothing to do with fingerprinting except for the fact that fingerprinting can be used to identify one person from another even identical twins DNA can be able to use to identify one person from another um, except for the uh, event of identical twins or triplets or whatever if they're identical because their DNA is identical and then clones if there ever are clones and uh, it's kind of interesting because I, I talk about cloning and I talk about rail and uh, railians and I just saw that there's a Netflix show on that uh, that just came out like I don't know a couple weeks ago so anyway um, DNA fingerprinting is just basically identifying pieces of DNA that that vary between individuals like because we don't you don't you wouldn't describe the suspect by something that's super common um, usually we get uh, fragments of DNA that are different right polymorphism is you know many changes different enough to provide uh, unique fragments um, and then you can uh, differentiate one person from another so um, no single fragment might identify one individual um, just so for example let's say that uh, someone you know robbed you and you're you're gonna use their hair color to identify them so let's say that you're that they have brown hair well what's the probability they would have brown hair and well and you would and it really I guess it depends on where you were right in Sweden there are probably not as a lot of as many people with brown hair as there are in South America so maybe they have black hair what's the percent of black hair in the population and red and blonde and whatever other variation there might be so maybe there's only four right so you might think okay well this is one fourth and this is one fourth and this is one fourth and this is one fourth but it's really not maybe there's a lot more people with brown hair uh, than there are red hair and you probably know that's true so I think only two percent of the population is redheaded and this is probably closer to you know 65 percent or something I don't know uh, I don't study hair but anyway we would have to account for that um, and then you know we use the same probability methods that uh, I taught you before we can multiply the variations we can use the rule of multiplication or addition to figure out what the probability is that that uh, person is the suspect so so I the question is if how much can I differentiate in a population of individuals that have four different colored hair from a person that has brown hair right can I can I just pull anyone that has brown hair off the street and say you did it no um, that's not enough but when you start adding in things like maybe you put in eye color so they have blue eyes and so that's going to reduce the number of individuals and maybe they're wearing you know uh, Air Force One Jordans or whatever so uh, and 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 uh, maybe they have glasses and maybe they have a tattoo and depending on what that is like maybe it's super specific so that might identify them 100% uh, but you know and it, we could just talk about blood typing right there's we talk we learned there's a and B and a B and O so you know this would be another identifier so we we can't use a single one of these to identify one individual from another in a huge population but um, taken together we can use this as a means of identification if we use enough polymorphisms all right so no matter how we use the polymorphisms um, we can map these just like we would map 
uh, mutations that show up in the phenotype. So we can't see them, but we know they're there. Um, and so this is kind of hard to visualize, but let's just say that this isn't an intron. So it, you're never going to see it. It gets cut out and thrown away. Um, and we talked about that during um, RNA processing. So let's say uh, on this chromosome we have A and T, and this chromosome we have G and C, right? This so this is this is in one person. So this is two two uh, polymorphic areas that we're looking at. And in this individual, this person is A T. So this person would be homozygous uh, for this mutation at both positions. And this person would be heterozygous for this mutation at both positions. All right. So remember when we're doing these test cross, we crossed it to a, to a tester, which is uh, homozygous, right? Everything's the same. Um, and then we can figure out and to a heterozygote and we can figure out like what's the recombination rate. So we know that this is going to be passed on if there's no recombination. No, I'm going to run out of battery. I got to pause it. Okay, I'm plugged in. So this um, would get passed on. This uh, would also get passed on. Right, so, so you can only pass on one, right? So this would be non-recombinant. This would be from this parent, because we're having you can only get one from each. This uh would be recombinant because it would have it would have to be caused by a recombination event. So we would have G C on A T. This would be one chromosome, and this would be the other chromosome. So we would this would be a recombinant chromosome here, and then of course this one gets passed on. So this is a two-point test cross. And we can tell how close these are by the number of recombinant events we get, just like uh, we did with uh, any phenotype, except we would have to be able to see this on the molecular level. So, like I said, most molecular markers don't have any effect on a phenotype. Uh, we talked about this mutations as synonymous. They're located in non-coding regions in introns. So, you can't detect that by examining. You can't tell um, if there's a uh, synonymous mutation in an individual um, because there would be no phenotypic outcome. And you couldn't detect a uh, mutation, like, even in the promoter region, like if it's in between the minus 10 and the minus 35, you wouldn't see that either. So the only way to actually look at this is to directly look at the DNA. And the only way to directly look at the DNA is to do DNA sequencing, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. So now, if we look at, like, uh, you know, a human or a Drosophila, and we include all of these vari variable molecular markers and usually they're numbered um you know uh with very unusual numbers because there's no like phenotypic outcome so if we look at this human chromosome there's only four genes mapped by mutants but we have 80 molecular markers and so we can we can figure out where the genes are located with one and with respect to one another even though they may be far or close together because we can look at the recombinations. All right, we examine the DNA. That's okay. How how do we examine the DNA? Well, um, different markers are are different. Uh, so. We can we can do a restriction fragment leak polymorphism and then we do a southern blot. Um, so basically, how this works is there are things called restriction enzymes.
and those restriction enzymes cut at specific sequences. Usually they're palindromic. So like a palindrome would be something that's forward and reverse, like 2112 or race car. Or, you know, there's other ones. Like I could I could make a really long one. Like Eva, can I stab bats in a cave? That's a palindrome. I'm not gonna write all that out, but so they're gonna recognize some sequence like A G C T, which uh, it's not, you know, there's no backwards here, but if you look at the other strand, it's A G C T. And so it recognizes these uh, repeated sequences, inverted sequences, and they're on both strands. And then it cuts it, right? So usually it cuts it in a staggered cut like this, but it's going to cut the DNA. And and the they came from they're they're basically like. They're used as like a like a immune system for a bacteria. So these all come out of bacteria, like uh, like there's one called Eco R1, and that's that stands for Escherichia coli restriction enzyme one, the first one that was discovered, and so that that cuts at a specific spot. And so let's say we had this piece of DNA, and I'm sure their slides are going to do a better job of this, but I, I'm just going to kind of go with the flow here. So let's say that there's an AGCT here. And so in one organism, that restriction enzyme would find it and cut that DNA. So we would end up with two pieces of DNA. Maybe this is uh, 10 megabases and this is 11. Or maybe it's just, let's just say this is 1,000 and we'll say this is 1,100. And we can run it out on a gel. Um, this this gel is made out of agarose and so what happens is, is that um, this agarose gel when it solidifies kind of looks like a molecular force like a super dense force like an Amazon rainforest so if you were chasing a rabbit through a Amazon rainforest who would get through first and the answer is the rabbit because it can move into smaller places than you and the reason I'm telling you this is because smaller pieces of DNA can move through this agarose gel further than others. So this thousand base pair is going to move further down. And by the way, DNA is negatively charged. If you didn't know that, surprise. It's also water soluble. Um, and it's because of that phosphate group. So we have the, uh, the oxygen, uh, which is negatively charged to a phosphate double bond. This is oxygen, oxygen. Um, this is a pretty normal functional group, so you should know that this is a monophosphate on DNA in the backbone. That's one of the reasons I had you draw it out. <clears throat> so DNA is negatively charged, so we put it through an electric field. The electric field, because DNA is negatively charged, it's going to go travel to the positive end. And let's say that this one is 1100. Well, it's bigger, right? So the bigger animal is going to hit more trees and branches in this molecular forest. And it's going to end up not going as far. And then maybe we have another AGCT over here and it cuts this. And maybe uh, this is, you know, 3000. Well, 3000 is not going to travel as far as these, so it might be up here. So this is kind of our barcode for this region. Now, if let's say mutation occurs here and you know mutations are pretty common and this turn gets turned into a C. Okay, well that restriction enzyme is not going to recognize that and it's not going to cut it. So this is going to end up with it'll be one solid piece that's 2100. So if this is 3000, 2100 is probably here and we would have the 3000 piece here. It would this would be a combination of these two. And so this w might be what this individual looks like when we do RFLP. Um, southern blotting is a way to look for this by using a probe. Um, and we'll talk about that later. But anyway, that's kind of how RFLP works. PCR is polymerase chain reaction. So instead of using this variation in sequence, we can get the actual sequence. Remember, we talked about the polymerase requires that three prime hydroxyl group and so we just we just order a primer so let's say i wanted to 
Um, let's say I'll I'll tell you a story. So, um, my kid, when he was five, was pretty sick. He was having some respiratory complications, and we're not sure what it was. We still don't know. Um, I guess that's a spoiler alert. But anyway, I took him to the pediatrician because he was having a hard time breathing and his skin looked a little blue. And I took him to the pediatrician and the pediatrician <coughs> measured his oxygen and found out that his oxygen level was like 89 or 88. And I'm like, okay, well, we're, I'll take him to the hospital. And she's like, that kid's not going in a car to the hospital. He needs to be on oxygen. So we're going to call an ambulance. And they took him to the closest children's hospital there was, which is the one right across from where I'm sitting now, uh, Cardon Children Hospital at uh, Banner Desert. Um, and so I I went in there. My wife actually drove, rode in the ambulance. I drove separately. Um, and when I got there, he was already in the uh, emergency room. And so I proceeded to discuss with the emergency room physician what was going on. And she said, do you hear that cough? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, that's that's whooping cough. And I said, really? You can tell that from a cough? And she said, oh, yeah. I was like, okay. Well, she doesn't know that I know what I know. And whooping cough is caused by a bacteria called Bordetella pertussis. And Bordadella pertussis um, actually infects the lungs and uh, kills the cilia. So that the, the cilia, if you remember from intro bio, uh, cilia job is to sort of beat stuff. So you have cilia that line your intestines and you have cilia that line uh, your trachea and your windpipe. And the cilia's job is to get pollutants and stuff out of your lungs. So if you don't have cilia, then you're going to get a cough because you can't have, you don't have really any way to get, I mean, simple pollution that you'd breathe in the Phoenix air going outside out of your lungs. So, you know, the whooping cough is also called the hundred days cough because it lasts a long time uh, before the cilia, you know, regrow. So anyway, uh, I know that my kid didn't have that because I gave him uh, antibiotics, azithromycin, a month beforehand, uh, and it didn't help at all. So I knew that it couldn't be bacteria, but I just let her go with it, and I, I kind of like got into a wager with her, and I, I said, she said, well, we're going to test this kid, and I said, okay, what test are you going to do? She's like, We'll do a PCR test, and then we'll do a, a swab test, a, a, a nasal swab test, kind of like COVID, right, before COVID. You know, he's my kid's almost 15 now, so this was 10 years ago. So anyway, um, I was like, all right, uh, I'll tell you what. If, if he has Bordetella, then I will pay you double whatever you're going to charge me for this visit. And if he doesn't, then you don't charge me at all. She wouldn't do that. Uh, I guess because she wasn't as sure as I was that it was Bordetella. But anyway, so I, I went home and I was, you know, he, he got better. Uh, I, I, it could have been pneumonia or, some, you know, I don't, I have no idea. Uh, I don't think it was. I don't think it was a bacteria. It's probably a virus, probably like RSV. I don't know. Maybe he had, maybe he was the first person to have COVID. I don't know. But anyway, so long story short is he got better and then I got my hospital bill. And my hospital bill for the PCR test was $2,400. And, and, you know, I have 80, uh, 20 insurance. But still, 20%, that's $400, uh, $480 of a $2,400 PCR test. And they did it twice. So, and I was like, okay, well, I'm a dummy because I have a lab right across the street. And not only that, but she told me that. They couldn't guarantee the chain of command of the bacteria. That's why she wouldn't bet me. That I remember now. She wouldn't bet me because she said that she wasn't sure that that sample would get to the laboratory intact. And I was like, well, why? They're like, we don't have an in-house laboratory that can do this. So we send it to 
I don't know, somewhere downtown, St. Joe's or something. Um, and so I kind of imagine like the pizza driver from Toy Story, like driving around with the doors flying open and stuff. And my kid's sample flying out of the window. And, you know, we never know. Like, the sample's lost. So I was like, okay, whatever. So, anyway, uh, it came back negative. Uh, but it cost me, like, I don't know, $1,000 for this test. And I could have done that te same test using PCR across the street. Um, because I can, I can find out the sequence of DNA. And once I have the sequence of DNA... Right. So let, let's say I just need any sequence and uh, I need a primer. Right. I need a, a piece of DNA that matches, that's complementary. So let's just say that this DNA is uh, three prime and this is five prime. So that my primer, I'll make my primer green. So my primer is going to be five prime to three prime. And this is how you order it. And that's why you need to know uh, which strand is written out and what strand you're copying and all this other stuff. So um, let's say that this is, uh, I'll just, since I already have this color out, I'll just say that this is A, G, C, C. And it'll be longer than that. And I'll show you why. So that would pair with T and C and G and G. Uh, and so maybe so this is A and T and C, G, A, A, G, T, G, G, A. I'm just making it up. So anyway, the polymerase would sit on here and it would look at this nucleotide and it would uh, replace that with, or it would c copy it, uh, A pairs with T, so then we would get a T in the new strain. So that's how PCR works. Um, and I'll get into the specifics of it. But I just want to show you how primers are made because I'm not the lecture isn't doesn't have that. So I'm just gonna go to So this is the National Center for Biotechnology Information in CBI. And I'm going here because I need to get the DNA sequence for Bordetella pertussis because I don't study that. And I want the nucleotide sequence. And so I'm going to type in Bordetella pertussis and this is the sequence. So I'm going to click on that. Okay, so I click on fast A and it's going to give me the sequence. Now I don't so this is one of the reasons you need to know probability and statistics. So statistically, and I don't know if this is going to let me write in it, but this might. Let's see. I'm going to try this drawing thing. So, so if we looked at something like an A, ooh, I might use this for now. So if we looked at A, uh, if we were just going to pick a random place anywhere in this genome, what was the chances that it would be an A? And hopefully you guys know that that's one-fourth. And then it could be a G, and that would also be one fourth. And it could be a C, and that would also be one fourth. So the human genome is a little over, it's between three and four uh, billion. Maybe I won't use this, this is kind of slow. But it, but it writes better. Three to four billion nucleotides, right? And so. If I want to exclude Bordetella from anything in the human genome, any sequence, I have to make sure that my primer is unique to this bacteria and not a human. So if I only made my primer one letter, then I would expect that that would bind every four places in the genome. So I would get a billion hits. I don't want that. I only want one. So how do I reduce that number? By making the primer longer, right? So what's the probability it would be an A and a G? Well, it's one fourth times one fourth, which is one sixteenth. And that's not enough. So then I add another primer and then it's one sixty fourth and then so on and so forth. So it turns out if you do about 20 nucleotides and that that's not a lot, right? But that's one fourth to the 20th power 
and that's a pretty big number. So that would that's I think it's close to ten billion. You can do the math on it, but that would should exclude uh, every living thing from everything else. So all I need is twenty nucleotides. I'm going to get out of drawing. All right. So I need twenty nucleotides. So I'm just going to highlight. You know, let's. I think these are each fifty. They should be fifty. That's how uh, this gen bank the deposit works. So that should be 150 sequences. And remember, this is written. Is this written um, as the coding or non-coding strand? So look it up um, because that's important. But anyway, so I'm going to copy this. We already talked about it. Uh, so now I'm going to go to, this was done by MIT students. It's called Primer 3. It's a software program. And, you know, there's probably better ones out there now, but I just, I know this one, and so I'm just going to use it. It's just as good as anything else. I'm going to paste the sequence in, and then I need a primer on the left and a primer on the right. And the reason I need that is because if I was doing this, it would just continue to the end. This will continue all the way down to the end of the chromosome. So I need another one on the other end, on the complementary strand, to border this so that I get a piece of DNA that lies in between the two primers. So this is so one would be a forward primer, one would be a reverse primer. And that would be on the other strand. I'll show you how all this works in a minute. But for right now, that's really all you need to know. So let's go back to the thing we're going to pick a left primer or right primer and I'll show you why in a second <coughs> we don't need a probe but we could pick a probe if we want um, and that's really all we need everything else is pretty default you could adjust for GC concentration so that would affect your melting temperature which you have no idea what that is unless you're a molecular biologist at this point but I will tell you in a second so anyway well, let's just say we're gonna pick our primer so we click on this pick primers and bam, so we get the primers. So so let's say I wanted to find out if my kid had Bordetella. Well, I'm almost there. If I get, if the PCR, if the primers match, it's going to copy the DNA. And if the and if I get any pieces of DNA copied, I know that it's Bordetella because statistically it can't be anything else by random chance. I mean, if it came up a positive, I would check it again against a different set of primers. Anyway, so IDT uh, pieces of DNA are called oligos, and you can order these. There are machines that do this. I like IDT because they're relatively cheap and fast. Okay, I accept the cookies. And so let's say we want products. We want custom DNA oligos. That just so. That just means a piece of, of DNA, a short piece of DNA. I mean, it can be long, but every time you, every nucleotide costs money. So the longer they are, the more they cost. You would need 20 nucleotides if you're looking at bacteria as a, on its own, because bacteria are only in millions of bases, not billions. So it's orders of magnitude bigger. Uh, and so we have to exclude humans because we're testing it in human cultures, right? Human cells. So anyway, so let's say I want to, I want to learn more. I want to order this. That's done. Uh... Ordering. Here we go. All right, here. So I don't need a lot. If I was gonna, if I was gonna sit out in front of the hospital and do tests for Bordetella for like a thousand people, I might want to order uh, in micromole concentrations instead of nanomole. But I don't want to spend the extra money if I don't need to. So I'm just gonna get the smallest amount because I'm only testing one person. <coughs> Honestly, this was enough to test like a hundred people. So let's see, I want to order a single strand of piece of DNA, which would be my primer. 
and I don't need to tag it with any fluorescence. And my kid's name is Brad, so I'm just going to say Brad, and this would be Bordetella pertussis. I'm going to call it F for forward primer so I know. And I'm going to get the smallest scale there is, which is the 25 nanomole. And I'm going to paste the sequence in. Remember, it tells you 5 prime to 3 prime. And if you want to modify it, you can. You can add uh, color dyes to it and stuff like that. I'm, I don't need any of that because I'll show you why. PCR doesn't require any of this stuff. Um, so it's 19 nucleotides. That's enough to exclude a human. Um, the minimum yield is going to be 12 nanomolars. The melting temperature is important because we're going to talk about annealing temperature, and that's dictated by GC because the more GCs you have, the more hydrogen bonds, the higher temperature you're going to need to break those bonds. So anyway, I I just need I'm gonna I need another primer, but I'm just gonna order one. I, I don't think I'm actually gonna order it. Okay, here's my shopping cart. I have the yield. This is the optical density. We'll talk about it later. Anyway, here's the cost. So eight dollars and seventeen cents. Uh, I I think the shipping is probably free because they're coming little tiny tubes. Smaller than the width of a ballpoint pen, so uh, the shipping is probably the cost of a postage stamp. Uh, and then I would order the other primer, so you're probably looking at twenty bucks. And that, remember, that's enough to test probably a hundred plus people for this disease. So the cost with all the reagents of of this PCR reaction is literally four dollars, maybe for everything yet they're charging twenty four hundred dollars with insurance now, if i didn't have insurance they probably could charge you five thousand dollars and this was a huge problem because people with breast cancer had to pay a company to do this um and they had to pay whatever they charged because they had patent that gene <coughs> the supreme court ruled you can't do that anymore so uh the cost have come way down but still, I mean, that's kind of outrageous. So, back to the lecture. That's that's how you make a primer for PCR, not how PCR works. We'll talk about that in a second. S&P microarrays. So, this is how, if you send your DNA to Ancestry or 23andMe, this is how they test it. Uh, they use uh, single nucleotide polymorphism microarrays. And then the other way is you can do direct sequencing. So, you can sequence it, and I'll talk about that in the next lecture. So this is how we figure out these markers. Okay, so I probably talked about all this stuff, but RFLP stands for Restriction Fragment Poly Restriction Fragment Link Polymorphism. That just means that it's a fragment that's created by a restriction enzyme, and it varies in length because if the length is the same, let's say that that enzyme cut here and this was a thousand base pairs and this was a thousand base pairs and we ran it in that dna gel <clears throat> it it would run at the exact same speed so we would only get one band we wouldn't be able to distinguish one from another it might be a little brighter but we wouldn't get those extra bands so it has to be a variation in length in order for us to use make it useful um, we talked about restriction endonucleases. Endo means inside. So restriction enzymes or restriction endonucleases cut on the inside of DNA. Uh, we talked about their short repetitive elements. I don't want you to know all this stuff, but uh, I'm going to show you that there's a whole ton of these things. Um, let's see. Restriction. I think New England Biolabs is the best one. New England Biolabs. I, they sell a lot of these things. Um, they're kind of the the creator of all these. So let's see. Restriction enzyme tools. Primer design. We don't need that. Uh, products. We want... Oh, here we go. Restriction endonucleases. 
I guess I'm in applications. Okay, so this will tell you how this works. So methylated versus non-methylated DNA, and that's how restriction enzymes can detect, can, can tell the difference between a bacterial piece of DNA and a viral piece of DNA. Um, what I'm looking for here is the different products. Okay, it's not going to show me that. Um, product listing. Click on this. Send me back. trying to tell me there. All right, I'm, I'm going to pause this. I'm just going to come back and look and see if I can find the list of restriction enzymes because there's probably a couple hundred of them and they're from different bacteria. Okay, so what I was doing wrong is I was looking at product overview instead of product listing. So I just click this tab and here's all the restriction enzymes. So you can click on each of these and it'll tell you, should tell you, what buffer it uses and what uh, region it cuts. So here it cuts the sequence and I guarantee you that this is the same forwards and backwards. GAC, GTC, GAC, GTC. So that's uh, inverted, right, repeat. And that's what restriction enzymes recognize. And then it's going to cut it. So this is a staggered cut here and here. And so you can kind of get, it tells you what it, the <coughs> units are basically how, how much DNA it can cut in a certain amount of time. Okay, well, why am I stuck here? Okay. So anyway, here's the list of restriction enzymes. And you can see that it is very, very big. All right. Each of these cut a different region. And generally, they're named after the bacteria that they're discovered in and the number of restriction enzyme that is found. So here's eco R1 that we were talking about. And eco R1 cuts the sequence, so it's a six base pair cutter, and it cuts GAATTC, which is backwards GAATTC. All right. So anyway, we use the, we just, you know, you buy them, you can buy them from a company and you cut DNA at various places, right? We talked about how it's mutated. Um, oh, good. I put it in here. So um, here's the sequence. We, we just talked about it. This is how it's named. It's Escherichia coli. Uh, this is the strain. It's RY13. And then the it's the first one identified. Okay, so uh, restriction enzyme cut sites on either side of a microsatellite. So let's say uh, this is the microsatellite repeated region. We cut it on each side. Oops. Okay, so uh, the size of the fragment is going to tell us uh, what the number of repeats, right? So if it has more A's and T's in there, then it's going to be longer. If it has less A's and T's in there, then it's going to be shorter. And so we can detect that in, a, in an agarose gel or, well, probably not an agarose gel. We need a polyacrylamide gel to actually detect that, which has a tighter forest than the agarose which is this sugar from the seaweed all right so we talked about gel electrophoresis we we put a charge through an agarose gel 
or it could be a polyacrylamide gel um, and that's going to move those fragments through the gel remember the shorter pieces go further than the larger pieces um, and we talked about like the frequency of cuts we talked so you can calculate this statistically um, since it's a six cutter it would cut every um, so so the probability of each of the bases would be let's say this is an a i don't remember what eco r1 is so let me just try to be g a a t t c all right so this is g a a t t c i don't do this work i usually do pcr and sequencing um so we would expect that that would cut every one out of every 4096 nucleotides and again it's just like the the uh, primer we would get a whole ton of cuts and we would get a crazy smear so we ran so if we did that we cut it with eco r1 and we ran it through a gel we would have just this crazy looking blob with you know any anything from you know thousands of different cuts to you know just a few so you know there's no way to distinguish these from one another and when you're doing this usually you want to do southern blotting which involves a probe so without getting into this and i'm not going to test you on this this is not generally done that often but you never know you guys might end up in a lab that does this so you have a solution of salt and water um and you have your gel, which is here, and you have a, a membrane that binds DNA. So usually DNA is negatively charged, so usually that membrane is positively charged. And the object is you want to get the DNA to come out of the gel and bind onto that membrane so that you can do things with the membrane. Because the gel is the consistency of jello, and it's harder to work with than, say, a piece of... Um, paper that would bind the dna and so you make a sandwich right the paper towels are just to draw the liquid up uh, the sponge is just to rest the gel on it so it doesn't dry out and the goal is to get the flow of liquid right uh, and so salt and water are going to uh, help well, water is going to help dna be uh water can dissolve anything with a charge so dna is charged so it's water soluble so anyway we we're going to get all the material from a gel this is our smears right from our rflp experiments and this is a what we call a dna ladder so it's it's pre-digested pieces of dna we know the size of that way we can get an estimate of what the sizes of these are so we're going to get a piece uh, most people don't use radiation anymore um, this is kind of an old school thing I probably should update this slide but I, I would guess that no labs use radiation anymore they probably use some sort of fluorescence um, but anyway just like I ordered up that primer you can order a probe right let's say that this is a sequence of near the microsatellite and so we're going to order up a probe that has uh, maybe a green dye attached to it or if you want you could order it with uh, radioactive p32 on it um, I, I don't think they've used that since graduate i was in graduate school but it's going to bind right and then you're going to be able to detect it so if it was a um, you would have a scanner that excites the the green dye and you'd see that or if it's radiation you would use an x-ray film but regardless it would tell you the size of that fragment and you'd be able to to differentiate it so this is an x-ray film uh, obviously this is using radiation and it's showing you exactly what I showed you that you're gonna have different size pieces because of the mutations that cause that enzyme not to recognize that sequence anymore okay so this is just kind of an illustration of this so let's say we have a and b and we have a deletion of a restriction site all right so 
here, the deletion would cause a large fragment, right? Right here. Um, this would be a smaller fragment, which would be here. And then a heterozygote would have one of each. So this is a heterozygote. If we had one that's AA, uh, it would have two pieces of DNA that were, were longer, right? So they're going to not travel as far, so right here. And they're going to be on top of each other. There's actually two pieces of DNA, but they're going to be the same length. So you couldn't distinguish those from one another. <coughs> uh, if we had an insertion, then it would make it longer, right? So here we would have, in this case, B would be longer. So BB would be bigger than AA. And then we'd have the heterozygote, which would have one of each. All right. So you can inherit these RFLP markers. Um, and there, there's, there'll be a couple problems in the problem set that I'm going to post probably this weekend for the next set of lectures. So we have parents and we have, they have siblings. And so let's say that the, uh, these are the potential genotypes. So AA would be a short piece. I don't know. I'll just make it up and say it's a thousand bases. Uh, little a, little a, big A, big A would be a thousand bases. Maybe uh, little a, little a has a mutation that it's longer, so it has two thousand bases. And this would be the heterozygote, one of each, right? So this would be the same size. This would be the same size. Um, each of these are different individuals. So let's say uh, this is just our reference marker. Uh, heterozygous, heterozygous, this offspring we would know uh, inherited uh, little a, little a. So let's just say this parent is, they're both heterozygous. So we know that there's a 25% chance of passing this on without recom excluding recombination. So uh, this parent would give the A, this parent would give the A, and then they would have the condition. I mean, this isn't a real condition. It's just that mutation or insertion or whatever has caused this piece of DNA to be longer. So just like in a in a pedigree, we fill it in, even though it's not a, like a a true phenotype that you would see like a white flower or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, half filled or a dot in it means that it's a heterozygote. So the heterozygote would look like this. And then the homozygous, in this case, dominant, even, uh, this would be shorter piece of DNA. It would have that restriction fragment in it. And so we could tell this individual from this individual from this individual. And we would, could also tell the genotype of the parents because there's no way that they would be able to have these three offspring unless they were both heterozygous. And we would expect this to be, you know, uh, one fourth, one half, and one fourth, just like standard Mendelian genetics. Okay, so that's a lot of work. <laughs> PCR is way easier. That's why I don't ever do any of that stuff. Um, PCR was developed by a guy named Kerry Mullis in 1983. Kerry Mullis uh, w won the Nobel Prize for this. Um, and he wrote a book called Dancing Naked in the Mind, M-I-N-D, field. Dance in the minefield and it's kind of an interesting read he's uh he basically like, the story in this is crazy and if you read this book you'll see it you'll see how he figured this out but basically he was like tripping on acid with his girlfriend driving up to a cabin that he had bought he worked for a company um and after he had he'd figured this out he he woke up in this cabin with all of this scribble all over the walls and stuff and he's like, oh, I think I figured out how to copy DNA in a test tube. And he worked with his girlfriend who really didn't care uh, at all about that. So he went to his bosses and he said, hey, I think I have figured out how to copy DNA in a test tube. And he showed them his data. And they said, oh, that's pretty cool, Carrie. We'll, we'll buy that from you for $10,000. And they turned around and sold it for uh, like, two, like $280 million. I mean, you can Google this, but. Uh, it was incredible. It was the most money ever paid to a patent, uh, for a patent to, to that date. Um, and so 
it's a great thing we use that we wouldn't be able to do any of the stuff that we do without pcr um we wouldn't be able to tell who the baby's daddy was is or any of the other stuff that we do if you have breast cancer or not if you if you have huntington's uh if my kid has bordetella all this stuff so so we can replicate dna in the test tube outside of the body that's the trick right because we don't need all those enzymes we talked about replication but we can get rid of helicase we don't need that we're going to just use heat um if you don't remember delta g equals delta h minus t delta s and so this is temperature and so we need we need that uh, two strands to come apart we have to reduce delta g and one way to do that because this is a minus symbol is to increase heat chemists use this all the time biologists can't use heat because that kills stuff right it changes the shape of their proteins and this is disorder so we can't disorder you either that's part of life so this would wreck your homeostasis this would wreck your order so you would be dead so this is really the only thing you could do in your body which limits us but once it's outside of the body everything else is open right we can get the we can play with these values to get a non-spontaneous reaction to be spontaneous so this stands for temperature and so because we uh, are going to vary the temperature to do different things here that machine is called a thermal cycler uh, thermo is temperature and cycle is you know up and down just like we talked about cyclins and um, mitosis all right so what do we put in this reaction well we need a buffer the reason we need a buffer is because changes in ph change the shapes too and we don't want that that would wreck our reaction so buffers maintain a relatively constant ph we use magnesium because this is a cofactor and if you forgot what a cofactor is i just went over this lecture with my 181 students if you forgot what a cofactor is you should look it up but it's an inorganic molecule that binds to uh, an enzyme that causes it to function and that co the cofactor for DNA polymerase our friend and this one would be three uh, is magnesium so we have so we want to make sure there's magnesium in there so it has its cofactor so that it works because without magnesium it won't work and without a buffer it wouldn't have the right shape so this is kind of the conditions of putting it in a tube so we have a test tube usually they're called micro centrifuge tubes we need the template we need the original strand of dna so let's just i'm just going to draw this out it'll be super easy uh let's say this is let me think about this three prime to five prime and this will be five prime to three prime so this is the original piece of dna and this sequence would be a g c t a c c g g a a t t uh. A. So complementary would be T C G A T G G C C T T A A T T. Perfect. So this would be our template, right? We're going to separate these two strands because we're going to need a primer. Uh, two primers actually, one on each side. So we're going to have a primer on this side. So it's going to be five prime. I'll just put it on this side five prime to three to three prime. So that would be T. You know, we you know the length. I'm not going to draw this thing out like crazy long, but you know it has to be the longer it is, the more specific it's going to bind. And we it needs that OH group, right? Remember DNA polymerase requires both strands, right? To, to bind to the correct shape. And then it requires that free three prime hydroxyl group. So the polymerase can bind here and synthesize this and so it's going to synthesize to the end of, well to the end of the chromosome right let's say the chromosome continues on forever so it would keep copying and then this one we would need the reverse primer so the reverse primer would be five prime to three prime so over here we have the three prime hydroxyl and we know the dna would copy be copied this direction because that's the only way it can copy on the three prime end this would be a a t so there's our primer um and so we're going to copy in both directions in opposite di uh 
directions simultaneously on two different strands. Um, and so the, the primers flank the area that we want replicated. So let's say we want this. We want this. We're going to end up with this area replicated, even though this chromosome might go on forever. Okay. Um, we need nucleotides. So we need deoxy. D is deoxy nucleotide. So deoxy nucleotide triphosphates. And then we need a special DNA polymerase. So, I mean, if you, you know that temperature, like crack an egg and put it in a skillet and see what happens, right? The albumin is going to solidify and can you undo it? So can you, when you fry an egg, can you make the egg whites go back to a liquid? No. And so when you heat stuff up, especially proteins, it's going to change their shape and it will irreversibly ruin them. If we used a human uh, polymerase, and we heated it up to the temperature we need to separate DNA, which is about 95 degrees Celsius, it would cook that polymerase. So one of the cool things is we use a polymerase that's called TAC, and that stands for Thermus Aquaticus, which is a, a bacteria that's found in the hot springs of Yellowstone. Right, and these in these hot springs at about 72 degrees Celsius, which is really hot. Um, it's thermally stable. There are other ones that they've discovered at the bottom of the ocean. It's called vent. Right, but anyway, so TAC is named from the bacteria Thermus aquaticus that it was discovered in, <coughs> and we use this polymerase all the time to copy DNA in a test tube. It has to be thermal stable because we're going to heat. We don't, we're not going to add helicase. Uh, we have to heat this up to separate the strands. So this is how it works. Um, we have a piece of DNA, right? Double stranded. This is the area we want to copy. This is where the primers are going to bind. So yellow is where we're going to copy. We heat it up to about 94, 95 degrees Celsius, and that's going to cause the two strands to separate. And then, uh, I have this in a, let me pause this. I have this in a kind of an animation. Okay, so hopefully I'm in the slideshow now. And so we heat it up, the two strands separate. And then we cool it down. So that allows the primers, the forward primer and the reverse primer to bind, which is shown here in red and green. Right. Remember, they're in a five prime to three prime because that's the only way DNA can uh, DNA has to add on that three prime free hydroxyl group. And then uh, remember the optimal temperature for the polymerase is where the, the temperature that the organism lives at. So what do you think the op optimal temperature for human polymerase is? Uh, 30, if you said 37 Celsius or 98.6, you'd be right. Uh, this bacteria lives at 72, like I said, so its optimal temperature is 72. That's where it copies DNA best. And we're going to get the DNA copied. And like I said, it's going to extend out to the ends of the chromosome. Um, and then we do it again, right? So we separate those strands. And then about 30 cycles, we continuously do this. And in the end, we're going to end up with about a billion copies of DNA. Uh, from a single strand of DNA. That's how they can catch you if you, a single cell, a cell from your tongue on a postage stamp. Um, just one strand of DNA. That's all we need. Um, and so anyway, we go through that cycle again and you can see now we're getting these regions that are very defined, right? And when we run that through an agarose gel, we'll be able to see that at that exact length. And we know that length because we had to know the sequence beforehand so we get fragments of the desired length right and then we you know this multiple six so in the end we get a billion copies um i'm just going to skip over this but there's a polymorphism and a tpa gene 
Um, it has a, a transposable element called ALU. This stands for the restriction enzyme uh, from the bacteria, just like ECO, e, ECO R1 <clears throat> that it was isolated from. And then, so that uh, piece of DNA, which is about uh, 300 nucleotides long, is going to be in there. And if it is, it's going to make this distance. So this, this distance is normally about 400 nucleotides from the primers that I designed to do this. Uh, if this is inside of it, then it's going to increase that length by about 300. So this piece of DNA would be 700, and this piece of DNA would be 400. And now we can detect, and by the way, this is on chromosome 8. So then we can detect, uh, so, so I like, this is 110. I have a new set of primers for this because we don't do ALU anymore. And the reason is that AL, if you have ALU, uh, it increases your risk of cardiovascular disease or stroke by about 1%. So the legal department said I couldn't use that anymore. So I use a play of thing called PV92. <clears throat> and PV92 is 300, uh, uh, 400 nucleotides apart. So this one, these sets of primers are only 110. And so if this is about 300, like I said, so when this is inserted, uh, we would get a fragment that's about 415. So the difference between this is 110 and 415, where uh, PV92, which is a different locus that doesn't cause you to have cardiovascular disease, couldn't affect you. Um, that one is of uh, uh, 400 or 700 nucleotides. So we do the gel electrophoresis, we put it, it in the gel, so if it's homozygous without ALU, right, so it's going to be shorter, we would expect that to run pretty far. If it's homozygous with ALU, that makes that piece bigger, right, and so it's going to run not as far. And if it's a heterozygote, we would get both bands. All right, so I can just, well... Let me pause this and I'll get at this. Okay, remember SSR is the same thing as uh, microsatellites. So we're just talking about re repetitive elements in the genome. So in this case, this is a CA repeat. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. All right, so that, that's going to be shorter. This We would call this allele 1. It's going to be shorter. This is two, it's a little longer, so it has more repeats. And then allele three, it's going to be a little longer because it has more repeats. Sorry, it's hard to see red on that background. So this one is longer than this. This one's longer than this one, and this one's longer than both of them. So it's not going to go as far in the gel. So individuals that have uh, these alleles, they're going to have this banding pattern. Individuals that have, sorry, so I should be more specific. Individuals that have one and two, right? One is the shortest, so it's going to be down here. Two is a little bit bigger, so it's going to be a little further up on the gel. Uh, individuals that are one, three are going to look like this, and individuals that are two, three are going to look like that. All right, so we can do the same thing using PCR, right? We can tell the links are going to be variable based on the number of repeats, and we can do the same thing with PCR. So um, when we do this, we, we might look at several different regions at the same time. So this is one pair of alleles. What's going on? This is one pair of alleles. This is another, stop doing that. Another pair of alleles. There's another pair of alleles. So this individual might have this banding pattern where we have you know this number of repeats, this number of repeats. This one is, this one's going to be shorter, so it's going to be down here. This one is going to be longer, so it will be up here. All right, this one is very short, so it will be down here. This one is longer, so it will be up here. And then this one is shorter, so it'll be down here. And this is just the number of repeats. And then this one here has 30 repeats, so it's up here. So anyway, we're just adding more, like it's just the same as adding like hair color, eye color, skin color, so on and so forth. The more identifiers we have, the more 
resolution we get, the more bands we get, and then <laughs> you can see that this is starting to look like a barcode. And that's how we can identify one person from another. So for OJ, there's only six of these, I think, or maybe eight. Um, the FBI uses 13, and if you use all of those regions, statistically, it will rule you out. Uh, the chances of you identify, identically matching somebody else with these repetitive elements is like one in a trillion. And that doesn't even include like a prosecutor's fallacy, which is even if there was another person exactly like you that was birthed on this earth, the chances of them being at the same place, sitting at that table, eating ice cream and murdering someone is makes it even a smaller probability. All right. So like I said, we don't have to label things with radiation. We use fluorescence. Um, and so we, we can use fluorescent uh, repeats, repetitive elements to, to look at the, these um, short tandem repeats. Um, so this is just an example of what would be done on a, on a human. So this is one loci, right? One region in the chromosome. And this person has 13 repeats. The way that this works is there's a DNA sequencer and the pieces of DNA that are fluorescently labeled go this there's a laser that scans this. And as this goes past, it peaks, right? So uh, this is going to give us a peak at 13 uh, repeats, right? Which is going to be shorter or than 14 repeats. And then this again, we're going to get uh, 14 repeats, which is going to be shorter than 17 and so on. And then the end, we're going to get this peaking pattern and we can tell this person at D19 S433 is 1314, where at w, uh, VWA, they're 1417. This one, they're homozygous, 11, 11, and then this one, they're heterozygous at 13, 16. Okay, so I'm just going to show you uh, how this works. There's a kind of a cool website called DNAi, which stands for DNA Interactive. And so it, 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 it talks about how we can use this. So let's go to the code. Wait, let me set our application. Yeah, I think it's in our application. And then we're going to go to human identification. And then we go to profiling. And then this is how we do DNA profile. So here's a repeat repetitive element. It's a four nucleotide repeat called GATA. Um, and then this is the 13 regions that the FBI use. So these are the different chromosomes, and these are the, the letter designation that I was reading off to you before. So at these regions, people are highly polymorphic. Right? If, if they weren't, if everybody had brown hair, we wouldn't. that wouldn't be an interesting characteristic. So these places are picked because they're variable. And usually it's because of those repeats, right? Remember the polymerase slips when it's copying those. So they expand um, or they could shrink, but either way, they're going to get their variable at those regions and because of those repeats. So, this, you know, we could count up the repeats, but the machine will do it for us. We add primers to it. So the when we add the primers and it makes copies, the primer and gets incorporated into the new DNA. So let's say we use four different colored primers. We can do a, a reaction in four different tubes for multiple chromosomes. As long as the size is different, it's fine. Then we put it into a gel. <clears throat> and then that goes in. This is an old school automated sequencer. And it, it'll show you this. Is, we talked about this. The laser goes back and forth and it's going to detect it. And then we, this is how we get this peaking pattern. And the computer, or you could do this by hand if you want, but it, it will tell you uh, what the 
repeats are for each of those individuals. So this is how we get the genotype. And this is just for the blue, right? So this one person is 12 in one and 14 in the other. This person is nine in both, so it's homozygous. And then, you know, we can get a overall picture of what someone's genome is of their genotype by using these 13 different regions. All right. So I think that's all I have. I know this is a long lecture. Um, I'm going to cover DNA sequencing in the next lecture, but I don't, there's not, a, I don't think I have any questions on the exam for that, but if I do, I'll cover it, but I just wanted to talk about sequencing. So that's the ultimate way to figure out these polymorphisms is to actually look at each of the letters of DNA. And the reason sequencing isn't really used is because it's very expensive. The human genome uh, costs $12 billion to sequence. Um, today, you could sequence your whole, whole genome for about a thousand. Um, so the price has dramatically dropped because the technology has increased exponentially and the computing power has increased exponentially. Um, and I'll cover like how we do this massively parallel sequencing uh, in the next lecture. I think an hour and a half is enough time for anyone to want to have a break. Even though you could pause this and leave whenever you want, right? All right, so until next time.